the subject is, uh, as you see, and the word zeitgeist uh, does not have an English, uh, proper English translation. Um, Zeit in German means time, and Geist means uh, mind or ghost or spirit, and it sort of encapsulates the spirit of the times. We don't quite have an English equivalent. And it talks about how there is a, um, it talks about how there is a, um, an era where all things change and they seem to change in seemingly unrelated fields. In the past, I've spoken to you about um, factors that have uh, deleteriously affected women and women's rights and feminine values. And today I'd like to talk to you about one that I believe is transforming the world and making the world better for women, and that has to do with science, but not scientific discoveries. I'm talking about the metaphors that science uses. Metaphor is a Greek word that means over and above and to bear a cross. So a metaphor is a part of a language that we use to uh, explain things. Now, science and math, which are traditionally associated with the masculine, have used metaphors um, that um, uh, in order to explain there, an, an equation is basically a metaphor, as is a mental model. And similarly, art and religion, which has predominantly been associated with the feminine, um, has used metaphors in the following manners. Now, if you were to take a list of words and put them uh, and give them to a group of people, although you could argue about a lot of these, I've arbitrarily put them into masculine and feminine, and this has been the way languages, uh, both English and other languages, have more or less uh, layered out masculine and feminine uh, throughout, um, throughout the history. And the good news is, is that there's an overlap between every individual um, in order for uh, procreation to proceed. Um, men had to be killers and lovers simultaneously. And in order for procreation and children to mature and proceed, women had to be cunning and caring simultaneously. So there is a significant overlap between the masculine and the feminine. I'm wondering, can you lower that just a little bit so we don't cut off the top of the heads of the slides, please? Um, you know, there's indisputable evidence uh, from ancient history and uh, from long ago that both men and women uh, uh, honored the feminine. We find this uh, in very strong evidence with women priestesses and uh, women conducting religious ceremonies and uh, women like Zenobia or Bodica uh, leading armies. And um, the standard mythology that was associated was uh, with the very powerful feminine beginning about 5,000 years ago. And that relates to the fact that uh, people became agricultural. And as we all know, that uh, tending a field uh, is uh, the same as tending children and raising uh, animals and herds is a lot like uh, raising children as well. So uh, animal husbandry and agriculture bring out the feminine uh, in, uh, in both men and women who engage in this activity. Now, for some peculiar reason, um, which uh, has never really been adequately explained, about 3,000 years ago, uh, the goddess uh, began losing power. And all over, the, particularly the Western world, uh, mythologies arose where gods uh, were murdering goddesses and usurping their power. And this went on for several thousand years. Uh, and during this period of time, by the way, there was no science to speak of. It was all practical knowledge, but not theoretical science. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with my book, The Alphabet Versus the Goddess, I propose that it was the invention of writing that brought about this uh, very uh, damaging change to women. And this was due to the fact that uh, neurologically, the brain is reconfigured in anybody that learns how to read and write as opposed to an oral culture where people speak and listen. Um, so the first cultures that adopted the alphabet, the Hebrews and the Greeks, uh, it was the Greeks who really initiated science. And uh, in order to um, bring about science, they, there was a very masculine culture. It's the first culture that had a uh, um, honored rapist to, for their chief uh, deity. I mean, Zeus was an acknowledged rapist, and their other chief god, Apollo, was absolutely humorless and not a lover. I mean, his, uh, he pursued Daphne, and she turned herself into a tree rather than let him uh, touch her. So uh, this guy was not exactly a big hit on the, uh, on the rounds. And of course, their most prominent goddess was Athena, who was very asexual. And um, 
as a result, one would uh, not expect, um, uh, rather, it was rather strange that she did not resurrect the earth or, or succor a uh, child. So this is a society that was very masculine, very macho, um, so it's not a surprise that science begins and with the uh, classical Greeks. And science, in order to talk about science, you have to form mental models. So the Greek science was very masculine. It was about levers and pulleys and fulcrums and perfect spheres and, and, um, and uh, absolutely perfect shapes. Uh, the Pythagoreans uh, had founded a cult on the beauty of perfect numbers, and they discovered irrational numbers, and they made it a, um, a feature of their cult that they were so upset that they discovered what an irrational number was, and irrational was sort of other and strange, and they, they made it a condition that no one could talk about this, that, that, if, that if anybody, you met somebody, you didn't tell them that you would discover this because it didn't fit in. Now, the father of Western science is this man, Aristotle, and although Aristotle is featured in all the philosophy classes and is honored and revered as this great sage, he was an unremitting misogynist. He felt that women were an inferior species and should always be under the control of a man. Well, the Greeks um, um, uh, had in a very um, masculine culture, and it was at this time that the languages uh, that we're familiar with today were beginning to form, and the languages began to insinuate in the language that there was a difference between masculine and feminine, that nouns were things and objects were masculine, processes were verbs, um, the things that were knowable were ma masculine, the things that were unknown, chaotic, strange, weird, those were feminine, and so on and so forth. Um, the Romans conquered the Greeks, and uh, they liked it so well, they said, boy, this is a good system, we'll take it just as it is, no corrections or additions. And then, um, then a strange thing happened about in the fourth century, Rome uh, collapsed, and with it, um, literacy got lost, and something called the Dark Ages began, which lasted for about 400 years. And um, when they emerged from those 400 years, this was a period of great superstition and barbarity, Travel was exceedingly dangerous. Commerce dried to a trickle. And of course, their art was uh, somewhat primitive. Um, but it was a very holistic time. There was a lot of practical knowledge. People were inventing all kinds of interesting things like the stirrup and the plow and uh, many other um, uh, advances. Uh, but this was also a time when women um, experienced the surge of um, and feminine values were uh, considered um, very highly. This was the age of chivalry. This is when troubadours were uh, singing the praises of womanhood, and women Christian mystics were hailed by the churches, having a clearer uh, channel to the kingdom of heaven than men did. And of course, abbesses led the monasteries all over Northern Europe. But of course, the most uh, remarkable thing is that these people began to construct enormous cathedrals that were dedicated to Mary. And of course, um, one has to ask, where did Mary come from? She's only mentioned eight times in the entire uh, New Testament, and she plays a very peripheral role, and yet during the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, uh, the whole medieval period was shot through with um, images of Mary. And then, of course, this all kind of was upended with the beginning of the Renaissance, uh, which was this male-driven, testosterone, um, creative surge of energy, and science was rediscovered again in the Renaissance, uh, primarily uh, by uh, beginning with the artists, and I should mention that the reason this title is Art, Gender, and Physics is that I'm also going to show that the artist uh, throughout history has anticipated these ideas in physics using image and metaphor prior to their uh, expression in numbers and equations in science. So perspective was an extraordinary the development uh, depended upon a very linear, sequential, causal, objective world. Um, People were using mechanical devices to learn how to draw in perspective. And, um, and it was a result, it was a very clean, mathematical, linear, masculine way to make a painting. Um, we noticed that uh, when God is sparking Adam, Eve is not in the picture. And um, this, is the way science, this is the way art uh, brought forth the Renaissance. But then, of course, science was using the discoveries in art because it was evident to anybody who was sitting on the surface of the earth that in the morning the sun comes up in the east and sets in the west, the moon comes up in the east and sets in the west, the stars come up in the east and set in the west. Clearly, we are at the center of the universe. 
However, there was this problem, and this problem was this one orbit of Mars, which in a time-lapse photography you can see that a couple of nights of every month, the planet Mars stops going forward, rises in the east, sets in the west, stops, and goes backwards for a couple nights. So this was a problem which no, everyone was trying to figure out, and um, Copernicus actually solved the problem by asking an artist perspectivist question. He said, what would the orbit of Mars look like if I could view it from the surface of the sun instead of the surface of the Earth? And of course, he came up with the heliocentric theory. And then Kepler asked the question, solving the, the mystery of the orbits by asking, what would, the, what would the orbit of the Earth look like if I viewed it from Mars instead of the other way around, which are both our artists' perspectivist questions. The thing that completely upended the Renaissance was Gutenberg's printing press in 1453, which transformed the world by bringing literacy rates uh, up from uh, the low 20s into the high 60s. And among uh, people traded an ear for an eye, basically, because reading and writing is very different than speaking and listening. Um, this was an age shot through with masculine values of warfare. Uh, this is when they, they codified and were able to figure out the linear trajectories of uh, missiles, uh, the great explorations. And of course, science was extremely masculine. It came out of the cathedral schools of the church that was for men only. Uh, the only language that was used was Latin. No Latin books were allowed to leave the university. Women were uh, punished on pain of death if they were found with a Latin book, uh, in possession of a Latin book. So they were excluded. And, and Francis Bacon, who uh, was one of the great founders of, um, uh, of Western science, uh, used the uh, metaphors of the uh, torture chamber witch um, hunts to, that were going on simultaneously <clears throat> to say how they had to put nature on the rack and make her reveal her secrets. So this was not a very friendly uh, um, society towards women. Uh, this was uh, the best epitomized, of course, by Isaac Newton, who came up with an incredibly dualistic mechanistic society, uh, way of looking at science. And the artist, too, had, had a very linear, you know, your eye starts in the lower right-hand corner of the painting and it follows through the painting. Everything was conceived of in a very linear way. Descartes made the uh, world of science and life be very mechanistic. It was cog and gears. And of course, the dominant paradigm, the mental model that the scientists used to express these ideas was the majestic clockwork that God had created, wound up, and then left to, to take care of other business. So this was the, uh, this uh, very cog and gear kind of model. And of course, this was a very unfriendly time to women. This was the Protestant Reformation when uh, uh, women were uh, being burned at the stake. And, um, and this was a fairly uh, period of time of uh, the age of reason was not very friendly to uh, women. Um, these modes of thought carried over into all aspects of life. People danced in these very mechanical, rigid dances. The gardens were laid out in very linear geometrical forms. And of course, this spawned the Romantic movement um, with Goethe and Byron rebelling against this. William Blake, the poet who painted this picture of Newton measuring the world, said, beware one-eyed vision in Newton's sleep, which of course is the perspective in art in Newton's mechanical paradigm. Well, this all changed because in the 19th century because a phenomenon that no one really understood before, which was lightning, was also combined with a phenomenon that no one really understood before, which was why a piece of metal always um, lined itself north and south. And uh, the discovery was made by a man, uh, Michael Faraday, who interestingly enough, his parents thought he was retarded because he didn't speak till he was about five years old. But um, this boy who did not learn language uh, was able to come forth with an incredible idea, and that is he put iron filings under a piece of paper and held a magnet, and he allowed us to visualize these lines of force. And thus, he founded the field of electromagnetism. There were many other people that contributed, but he gave us the first mental model of it. Well, electromagnetism was something entirely new. It was invisible, it didn't have any moving parts. It was relational, it depended upon the attraction of opposites. And you had to conceive of a electrical, um, electromagnetic field in its totality. The, it's very much like 
men and women. It's like, um, it's interesting that the poets had always talked about love using the metaphor of flame. But as soon as electromagnetism was discovered, they began to use the metaphors of, um, of sex. So the most common metaphor, of course, was that it was a field, an electromagnetic field, which of course is a term uh, borrowed from uh, agriculture. And of course, it was a web and a strands and waves. And of course, it most resembles, uh, people talked about the spark of love or an electrifying kiss or the, uh, the magnetic personality or the aura of a person. So all of these terms that were in electromagnetism were now being used in um, poetry to describe the attraction between opposites, man and woman. Electricity is basically feminine as opposed to Newtonian's very masculine metaphors. So what this causes is the men who are the principally the scientists begin to have to think of the world in using feminine metaphors. Now one of the um, signature icons of electromagnetism is this bar pattern, which you see whenever an electromagnetic field is present. And of course the artist began to do some rather strange thing. Had an artist ever painted trees without ever seeing the tops before? I mean, was there um, uh, Mon Monet and Manet began to introduce this bar pattern uh, in a lot of their paintings, and it was the same pattern that you see in electromagnetism when you start to see paintings that appear to carry over this image. Now, the other image of electromagnetism is waves, and of course, water, which is always associated with the feminine, is the uh, most clear-cut example of how the metaphors for electromagnetism became very feminine. The artist who best exemplifies this was Vincent van Gogh, who seemed to paint an aura about his head. It was as, as if the electromagnetic essence of himself extended beyond himself, and he saw the same thing within the culture at large, that throughout um, all the landscapes that he painted, there was this extraordinary, almost um, wave-like pattern to his work. The most remarkable thing, however, was the way he saw stars. You know, you and I look out in the nighttime sky, and what do we see? But we see little white dots. Well, he didn't see white dots. He saw these extraordinarily swirling, colored objects. And it turns out that it wasn't until the 20th century that we were able to develop radio telescopy, and we were able to see that the colors that we can't see from stars and galaxies actually closely resemble the uh, image that Van Gogh gave us in the 1870s, uh, long before a radio telescope was ever invented. Now, in the um, Becquerel had some photographic film in one room, and he was working with some uranium in another room, and the film kept getting exposed. So they kept throwing it out until one day he said, why is this film being exposed? And then, of course, with Rankin, he discovered the x-ray. And x-rays, of course, changed the way we do medicine and many other things, it was a major discovery. But of course the artist, Seurat, had began making charcoal drawings long before they discovered x-rays that looked remarkably like x-rays. And then of course Man Ray and Rauschenberg and a number of other artists used x-rays to, um, to create art. So you can begin to see that at the end of the 19th century, the paradigm is shifting towards, towards women because Nietzsche declared in 1888 that God is dead. And what he was talking about is that the bearded white guy in a cloud that had dominated the life of so many people in ancient times was fading because science was chipping away at his authority. But at the same time, the Catholic Church in 1854 declared that Mary had been born of immaculate conception, which meant that if she, didn't, uh, wasn't, if she herself was born by immaculate conception, then she had to be divine. So they elevated Mary from the status of being a, the, a, the mortal mother of Jesus to being a divine figure. So you see the, the fall of the masculine and the rise of the feminine occurring in, uh, in the society at large. It even fell over, the zeitgeist went over to architecture. You know, there had never been a building before that was a see-through building. And when they held a competition in Paris in 1886 to see if they could um, build a monument for the French Revolution for 100 years, they held a competition. And a man who was an engineer, a railroad engineer by the name of Gustav Eiffel, submitted his um, proposal to make it look like a railroad bridge, which was actually the lines of tension 
frozen as if you would see an electromagnetic field. Well, it's very interesting. I, there's a letter that the artists and the sculptors of Paris wrote to the commission saying that this is an abomination, that you cannot allow this man to build this thing in Paris because it would just ruin the skyline. It's the worst thing that could possibly ever happen, blah, 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 and the rest is history, of course. Uh, when Eiffel built this in 1886, how could he have known that 20 years later when Marconi discovered the radio, that the Eiffel Tower would become not only the symbol of, of static electricity, but it would also become the tower upon which the radio and television antennas that are used to transmit um, electromagnetism are primarily used. Electromagnetism even shaded over into architecture in other ways, such as the architecture of Gaudi in uh, Barcelona, that anyone who's ever seen those buildings is struck by the fact that this is a man who actually made wavy buildings. Now, the, when the 19th century drew to a close, they uh, gathered a panel of art critics together in Paris, and these were the most prestigious art critics, and they said, they had a panel of seven men, and they said, what do you think is going to be the art of the 20th century? And they said, well, you know, we've exhausted the creative reservoirs. Uh, there's no, a little filigree here and arabesque there, but my God, what we saw at the end of the 19th century, that's the end of art. And the, there was a man in the U.S. Patent Office that recommended shutting down the U.S. Patent Office because he said everything that had, of note had been discovered was discovered already. There was no point. And the most famous physicist of the day, Lord Kelvin, or J.J. Thompson, who discovered the electron, said, well, you know, there's these last two little um, uh, features of light that we need to solve, and then we can close the book on physics just like we close the book on uh, anatomy and move on to something else because um, you know, we can fit everything into me Newton's mechanical paradigm. Well, this man, Max Planck, completely changed everything because he made a discovery. He discovered that the seamless linearity that the world we think, we think is the way the world works and that sequence is actually a very discontinuous, jerky process. He discovered that electrons jump to higher orbits when they're circling an atom and they take on energy or give off energy. And they're here and then they're there, but they're not in between. So, so, so quant they're in quanta. So they're discontinuous. And then he made the other discovery that at the very basis of, of um, subatomic physics, the world is very random, that there's very probabilistic, very unpredictable. And as you can see, Unpredictability is what men talk about women. You know, they, it's a feminine, it's a, it's a way that men describe what's other and what's strange and, and what's, what's unpredictable because men like to have predictability in their life. The art of this time, of course, or earlier time had always been this very linear sequence, seamless, you know, your eye is dragged by the artist Bruegel through this painting it's because he, he can, makes you follow how he wants you to see the painting. Compare that to this painting of Manet, who painted this long before Planck, when he, and another one, when he does this very discontinuous, your eye just kind of leaps around this painting. There's, there's no way to have to go through this painting in a rather seamless fashion. And there was a bunch of series of discoveries, a zeitgeist, that was happening at the same time as that the uh, ophthalmologist discovered that we, when we look at something, when we move our eyes, we don't really see things like they're just moving gently. Our eyes are just kind of jerking around, doing saccadic eye movements, much like quantum uh, in physics. And at the same time, we had always thought that people were a blend of characteristics, but Mendelian genetics was discovered, and it was all or none. It was either you had the dominant trait or the recessive trait, and only one operated. The other one, it wasn't, it wasn't a, 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 like they got a mixture. And then the same thing happened with nerves. You know, when we make a motion like this, we always thought that this is a very gradual motion. Well, it turns out that the nerves either fire or they don't fire. It's either or, which of course is the great principle of physics of, uh, of computers, the ones and zeros. So as a result, this was uh, uh, the realization that the world was actually fairly discontinuous, which was beginning to challenge Newton's ideas. Um, the artist that discovered this with the chronophotographer, uh, Moybridge and others in the late 19th century, that you could take static images of things that show one thing after another. The art of discontinuity, of course, is cubism, 
which uh, burst forth in 19, uh, the early part of the 20th century. And uh, the Cubist paintings illustrate this notion of discontinuity. Uh, another artist who was able to demonstrate this feature was Monet. You know, before Monet, when people, uh, artists painted water, water was a very constant subject that people were painting water. And this is the way they painted water. And you know, if you look at water, that's not the way water looks. This is the way water looks. And if you're looking at water, and the water is gently moving, it's very probabilistic. You have no idea where the next uh, reflection of light is going to come off the water, or what's going to happen next. So it's discontinuous, and it's also probabilistic. Uh, Ren Renoir did the same thing with light falling through, um, through trees. And of course, uh, what could be more random than this new dance craze that seized Europe called the waltz, where uh, one man picked a joined with one woman, and they randomly moved wherever they wanted. They broke the rules of this mechanistic kind of dancing that was the characteristic of the Renaissance. Now, now uh, Boltzmann was a physicist who was trying to tell the other physicists who believed in Newton's mechanical paradigm that the world was basically random, and he couldn't convince anybody, so he committed suicide. He should have waited, because um, <laughs> the artist was already introducing an idea that had not been seen before in art, and that is the figure of the Harlequin. And beginning in the 1860s with the Edward Manet, uh, the Harlequin uh, becomes the subject of virtually every single artist begins painting Harlequins. And Harlequins are a rather strange figure. Uh, Picasso painted a whole lot of Harlequins, and, and he becomes a very dominant figure in art. So the question is, who, who is the Harlequin? Well, the Harlequin, of course, is the joker in a deck of cards. He's the jester. Um, at the court. He's the fool in tarot. And as we all know that if you play poker with a joker in the deck, all bets are off because you can't play the odds because it introduces an element of unpredictability into, um, into the game. So here's artists that are introducing the notion and of course the symbol of the gesture becomes Charlie Chaplin who in the 20th century becomes the most famous person in the second decade of the 20th century. And his films are this kind of jerky, discontinuous thing. And there, has there ever been uh, a famous person in the world who was, a, who was a comedian? I mean, if you look at encyclopedia books and compare to Pericles and Napoleon and Julius Caesar, you don't find comedians. And here is someone who epitomizes the zeitgeist of the age is Charlie Chaplin. Uh, the artist also played with many other symbols of uh, chance. Uh, the horse races were a common subject in art as was the stock market, the cotton market. And then, of course, the Dada movement was all about probability and randomness. Uh, this painting by Jean Arp was constructed by his climbing up a ladder and cutting out these um, different colored pieces of uh, paper and dropping them on a big canvas and then gluing them to wherever they landed. And that was the art. So uh, Tristan Sarza, one of the poets of the Dada movement, took the newspaper and cut up lines of, of uh, of the newspaper and put him in a bag and shook up the bag and he threw it out on the table and whenever, whatever random arrangement the lines fell, that was the poem. So um, that was Dada. Of course, there were other discoveries being made that were changing um, the way people thought about the world from masculine to feminine. One was Albert Einstein's discovery of relativity, which led Minkowski to the fourth dimension. And the fourth dimension was recursive. And of course, the artist had anticipated this by uh, drawing the Mobius strip, which is the perfect mental model for one to think of the recursiveness and the never-endingness of space and time. Now, this is when they discovered the fourth dimension. The mathematicians would say, "Well, what if, if a line is the uh, in two dimensions and a point is in one dimension and a cube is in three dimension? What does a four-dimensional object look like?" And this is what it looks like. It, this is known as a hypercube. Uh, this is the 3, 3D representation of a fourth dimensional uh, hypercube. Well, I want you to look at this painting by Dali and notice that the cross, could you lower that just a little bit, please? That the cross that Jesus is on is a hypercube. But not only is it a hypercube, but if you look at the painting, you'll notice, and unfortunately it's cut off in this slide, I don't know why that is. There's a checkerboard pattern on the floor and directly underneath where the um, where the cross is, the shadow of the cross from a light coming down from above 
is just a cross. There's no checkerboard pattern. So it's as if Dali is saying, perhaps we in this three dimension are really shadows of a fourth dimension, of, of ourselves in a fourth dimension, that all objects that exist in this world, just as our shadows are two-dimensional reflections of a three-dimensional object, that the shadow of this object would be uh, the, this cross on the floor. Well, Einstein was um, inexhaustible in terms of his creativity, and he also invented the, or created the wave particle dilemma. He discovered that light could be these discrete little machine gun bullets with darkness in between them, as well as what Newton had shown and others, that light was also a wave. So the wave particle duality and dilemma, something that uh, occupied the physicists for some time. And of course, uh, the man who solved this was uh, Niels Bohr. And Bohr came up with his complementarity theory when he said, you know, the wave particle dilemma could be solved. It isn't, as Aristotle said, either or. It's both and. They can be both and at the same time. You know, Bohr said that the opposite of a prof uh, profound uh, of a truth, uh, the opposite of a truth is a falsehood, but the opposite of a profound truth is another profound truth. Uh, when the Danish king um, knighted him for his work in uh, quantum physics, uh, Bohr chose as his heraldic symbol on his shield uh, the yin-yang symbol of China. So, um, so there were a whole bunch of art, uh, works of art in the 20th century and earlier that encapsulated this idea that something could be both and, that you could move through opposites and achieve the other side. Um, here you have Monet painting the bridge over his garden at Givernay, and this is the particulate version. And of course, he also painted it in a waveform. Um, the complementarity of opposites, of course, uh, is exactly what uh, uh, the eroticism uh, and the sexual tension between men and women are. So the, the, the notion of complementarity uh, was also a notion that increased men having to deal with metaphors that were primarily feminine rather than masculine. Uh, probably the symbol that best uh, demonstrates the wave particle uh, duality is the American flag, which Jasper Johns painted a whole bunch of, because the flag consists of stars, which are all particles, and we see this uh, bar pattern of the stripes, which of course is the signature icon of um, the wave form. Now, I believe that uh, women's rights uh, achieved their greatest um, and fastest were in the United States. Women received the vote in uh, 1920 in the United States and 1936 in England, and the continental nations uh, received women's rights were considerably far behind them. And the reason I believe that is so has to do with the English language. You know, every child uh, at the moment, uh, that as soon as they start learning language, learn that all the nouns have a value, and the value is sexual. What a strange concept, that every noun has to have a masculine or a feminine article before it. Now, the nouns that are receptacles, like your urns and vessels and cups, and holsters and scabbards are feminine, and the tools that thrust and cut and saw and are, are masculine. Well, you can use a little barnyard, um, rustic common sense to figure out whether a noun in a foreign language is masculine or feminine. But then you get to the abstract nouns, which have no relationship whatsoever to the objects they're describing. So how did they assign values to them? So isn't it interesting that in France, in French, for example, most of the positive nouns are masculine, like power. And most of the feminine nouns, like sickness, are feminine. And you can see that that holds in all the other Romance languages and continental languages, except English, because English doesn't have any gender nouns. So I think that the fact that little boys don't learn at age two or three that, gee, being a boy is pretty good because all these good nouns are my nouns, and all the bad nouns are her nouns, and little girls have their self-esteem immediately diminished uh, at, little, at a very young age before they even understand what's happening. So America and England were two English-speaking countries, and of course women's rights um, advanced the fastest there. So then we have um, 
uh, Werner Heisenberg, who along with Bohr uh, was one of the founders of quantum mechanics. And he came up, um, when Bohr came up with this complementarity theory, um, Heisenberg came up with the uncertainty principle. And the uncertainty principle states that, you know, you can only know you, you, that it, there's certain things that are unknowable about the atomic world, that, that if you know the momentum of an electron, you can't know its spin. If you know its location, you can't know its speed. The more you know about the one thing, the less you know about something else. And he said that, that the subatomic world is basically unvisualizable. We cannot make a mental model of what it looks like. And he and Bohr came up with this incredible notion that the observer affects the, the, um, uh, what it is that you observe. You know, science has always been based on objectivity, which is a very masculine, dualistic way of looking at the world. And subjectivity, or intuition, is a much more feminine way of looking at the world. And with quantum mechanics, the scientists had to admit into their bastion, the, their nemesis, which was subjectivity. Now, the artists have come up with many um, examples of this uncertainty principle. Here in this Jasper Johns uh, vase of the um, profile of Picasso, you can either see Picasso's profile or you can see the vase, but you can't see both at the same time. Uh, in this Dali painting, you see the vase, you see the face, but you can't see both. Same with this uh, image that he also painted. Here is the symbol of rationality, this bust of Voltaire by Houdin in the 17th century. And of course, Dali makes fun of it by using this, in a, a, the bust, and you see, either you see Houdin or you see the two nuns uh, in the marketplace, but you can't see both at the same time. The same thing with Chichilu's um, tree. You can see the babies or you can see the tree, but again, this are principles of uncertainty. Now, Picasso did a very interesting thing. And again, I, I want to emphasize, I don't think that the artist at all was interested in what was going on in physics. They, they did not set out to say, gee, I woke up one morning, I think I want to draw uh, an example of what uncertainty is. You know, Ezra Pound said that the artist is the antenna of the race. And T.S. Eliot said that great art is, communicates before it is understood. So the visionary artist creates a work of art that resonates with all of us. We don't, we don't know what it is, what it is that affects us, but it affects us in some unconscious level. And what it is is that the zeitgeist is changing. And it's the artist who's creating images for ideas for which there are no words. You know, space-time continuum, quantum jumping. You can't really describe that in the English language. The words just don't work. But, um, so that we needed new images, and the artist was supplying them. So Picasso did a whole series. Again, this, uh, the slide's too big for the, uh, my screen's showing it fine here. Could you change that on the screen? Picasso did a whole series of drawings of where he drew the painter drawing his model. And if you'll notice in this series, the more the artist is painted representational, the more abstract the model is. And the more the um, artist is abstract, the more realistic the model is. So, so here was an artist who was saying, you know, you can either see the artist clearly or um, see the model clearly, but you can't see both at the same time. <clears throat> now, Kandinsky in 1911 was um, uh, painting a painting that he was very unhappy with. So uh, what he did is he uh, took the painting and he said, ah, I hate this thing. And he took it and he turned it on its side and he went for a walk in the woods. And he was lost in thought for a couple of hours and he came back and he was walking across the threshold and he looked up and he looked at this thing and he said, what, what, what is that? What, 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 who, whose painting is that? What did I do? And then he said, oh, I've turned it on its side. And then he said, you know, actually that kind of looks kind of interesting. When I didn't know what it looked like, that's kind of interesting. So he introduced the idea of abstract art, art without a visualizable image, which of course Mondrian and Mayavich immediately followed. And this has become the most enduring art movement of the 20th century. So isn't it interesting that at the moment that the physicist said, we cannot create a mental model of what the atom looks like. This is the moment that the artist creates an art form that does not have a recognizable image. Now, the 
work of art that best encapsulates Heisenberg's work is this construction by uh, Marcel Duchamp called um, With Hidden Noise. And Marcel Duchamp told his patron, uh, Walter Annenberg, he said, take an object, a small object. Don't tell me what it is. And I want you to put it in the center of a spool of thread. And then I want you to give it back to me. So Arnenberg did this. He's the only one who knows what's in there. And then Duchamp took these two metal plates and these four screws, and he made this thing, and it's called with hidden noise. And if you pick it up and you shake it, you don't know what's in the center. You know there's something there, but you don't know what it is. Well, Bohr and Heisenberg discovered that here's an atom, and the atom is minding its own business, and the electrons are circling the atom. It's doing what atoms always do. And I, the observer, want to know what the atom looks like. So I turn around, and I look at the atom. And when I look at the atom, in order to see it, I've got to shine a light on it. Well, light is energy. So when I shine a light into the atom, it discombobulates the atom. So now what I see is no longer what it was before I looked. So the process of looking changes what it is that I was looking at before I looked. So here we have this work that we don't know what's in the center. And the only way to find out is to unscrew the four screws, take off the two plates, unwind the thread, and then you'll have the object and you'll know what it is. But now it's no longer what it was before you set out to find out what it was. So that the process of examining something and looking at it changes what it is that you looked at. So Heisenberg and uh, rather uh, Bohr and Einstein uh, introduced quantum mechanics along with a host of other physicists. And all of the terms that the physicists used to describe quantum mechanics were feminine. I mean, if you read their works, they say, this is bizarre. This is weird. This is strange. This is uh, 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 unknowable. These are all the terms that men uh, had been using <clears throat> to describe the feminine. Bohr said that everything in the universe is interconnected in a web. That you cannot do anything in the world to anything without everything else being affected. Well, that's not a mechanical idea. That's an idea of ancient mythology that all the webs and all the nets were always associated with goddesses in ancient mythology. So here we have artists that produce ambiguous works of art. This is Clay's ship. Are you standing on the bridge looking down over the ship? Are you seeing it from the side? It's ambiguous. It, is, it isn't clear what, what the point of reference is. Here, Escher produces paradoxical images. They make no sense. And yet, they do make sense. And it's this, this feeling of, of sense within no sense that is the essence of quantum. And, and of course, the paradoxical nature of Magritte's paintings, as well as many of the other surrealists. Um, here, Magritte says, this is not a pipe. <laughs> well, of course it's not a pipe. This is a painting of a pipe. It's not a pipe, but it is a pipe. So of course. There's this incredible wordplay of what quantum mechanics is all about. You know, when a child be, doesn't know any language, they see the bottle, and they know what the bottle is, and they have this concept of bottleness, that the mother can turn the bottle in all different directions. The baby never loses track that that's the bottle. And, and before they have language, they, they point. They want the bottle. The minute they learn language, and they learn the word for bottle is bottle, then the word blots out the image. And we, once we acquire language, we're able to think without images. We can think of freedom and, and economics and destiny, words like that. We don't form any mental images. We don't, we don't see the little woman with the, with the uh, scales uh, when we think of justice. We just use the word justice. So language blots out the images. However, when we're confronted with new ideas that require new language, and, and that the ideas have outstripped the language, who in our culture creates the images that allow us to understand that? And I maintain it's the artist. Now, Newton was never uh, very funny. I mean, he was a very humorless guy, as was most of all of the scientists. And suddenly, the scientists became whimsical. 
So they started to describe the subatomic reality using words like quarks had charm. Well, it turns out that charm and glamour are words drawn from the witch hunts. You know, when a man said that he was charmed by a woman or a woman was charming, that was preparatory to burning her at the stake because she cast a spell on him. So, so it's interesting that the physicist would reach back into the language from the witch hunts to begin to describe physical reality in terms that were um, incredibly loaded negatively, but now became kind of charming, kind of funny, you know, kind of uh, amusing. Now, Jackson Pollock uh, did something that uh, no other artist in the 5,000 years had done before. Um, other artists were interested in creating an object art. They wanted to make a painting or a sculpture or whatever it was. They wanted to make a thing. That was the work of art. Pollock said, I want to capture the process of painting. And the process of painting is the artist holding their brush in their hand and going like this. So how does an artist capture the process of painting? And the way he does it is he threw the paintbrush away and he put the canvas on the floor and he took the paint and he threw the paint on the canvas. There are more photographs of Jackson Pollock creating his art than any other artist making art. Why is that? Because the end product is a record of how he moved that day. You know, people stand in museums, they say, oh, I see a horse's head, or this makes me feel good. I mean, that's not the point. The point is, is that what he's painting is this is the record of how, of the motion of his action that he did the day that he painted the painting, or the days that he painted the painting. Well, the physicist at the same time was discovering that at the very core of reality, you know, Democritus 2,000 years ago in ancient Greece said, there's atoms and the void. And we Westerners can't say anything about the void, so let's talk about the atoms. Of course, in the East they said there's atoms in the void, and they said we can't say anything about the atoms, so let's talk about the void. Um, but for 2,000 years, Western science has been trying to break down, atom means uncuttable. They wanted to get down to the very, very little tiniest billiard ball of substance. And as they did that, the more they did it, the more they did it, they found that it wasn't solid. There was no really solid, uncuttable atom. Then in point of fact, the atom consisted of huge, enormous, empty spaces. And then when you got down into the subatomic particles, you found that those two, and that it was all about process. It was all about verbs rather than nouns. So at the moment that the artist is creating a work of art, that encompasses the processes of painting and art, that's when the physicist is coming to the conclusion of, of the same thing. Now, it's interesting that the physicist is using cloud chamber photographs, which are records of how the subatomic particle moved in the cloud chamber, but the particle's not there. All you're seeing is the, the trajectory that it made in the cloud chamber. So it's a record of how the particles moved. And of course, there's an uncanny resemblance between Jackson Pollock's paintings and cloud chamber photographs, as, uh, as there are in many other uh, works of art. So that brings us to chaos theory. And chaos theory, every ancient deity associated with chaos was a goddess. You know, order and chaos, you know, Apollo was the god of order who defeated chaos, because order was the masculine way of imposing culture onto nature, which for men has always been wild, untamable, and unpredictable. So here are a group of scientists that begin to work in a field called chaos theory. And what they discover is that there is order in disorder. They discover that organic forms arise from, catch this phrase, strange attractors. This is what a strange attractor looks like in physics. Is there a man in this audience that has never met a strange attractor? <laughs> I mean, what an interesting choice of words to, to create a metaphor to describe something in science. And 
a lot of modern art is chaotic, like this painting of de Kooning. But if you study this painting, even though it looks chaotic, there is an order underlying the seeming chaos of it. The last subject is uh, fractals, and fractals are uh, geometrical forms that we've discovered that the world consists of layers upon layers upon layers, that the coastline of California, when viewed from 200 miles up, looks exactly like the coastline of California when you get one inch away and you study the uh, outline of a rock that's on the coast. And of course, the artist also captured that idea uh, by uh, Joseph Cornell and the Duchamp creating miniatures and Jasper Johns creating the American flag in fractal layerings. Now, Watson and Crick uh, won the Nobel Prize because they solved the problem that no one could figure out. And that was, after the 1900s, we understood that DNA was the molecule that replicated life. But no one could figure out what did it look like. So people were making mental models of what this, um, add up what this molecule looked like. And they couldn't figure it out. And, and they figured it out because they figured out it was a double helix. And the double helix of DNA is actually two snakes um, entwined about each other. The ancients understood that the symbol of life, the symbol of vitality, is two snakes entwined about each other. This is in Egyptian and Mesopotamia. There are two snakes entwined around the tree of life in the Meso Mesopotamian Garden of Delight. There's snakes entwining themselves around the tree of immortality on the Isle of Hesperides that Hercules had to get. And of course, once monotheism came along, they got rid of one of the snakes, and there was just one serpent in the Garden of Eden. But isn't it interesting that biochemistry, and now science has shifted into this new world of the biological sciences, and of course women are making outstanding um, contributions. You have Nobel Prizes awarded to Marilyn Yallow and Rosalind Franklin and Barbara McClintock, and we will see more of this. And women are being invited into science because science is now using metaphors that are feminine, that the men have to accord a greater value to the feminine because they can't do their science without thinking in terms of chaos theory and complementarity and um, uncertainty principles. That's how they do their science. So I think that this shift in science, which has nothing to do with the discoveries that they're making, but has to do with the mental configuration of the way men and women have to think about science, is promoting and elevating the value of the feminine uh, over the value of the masculine. And this trend will continue. Of course, this isn't going to occur overnight. We're still living in a world that is, um, is uh, fairly patriarchal and misogynist, but it's changing. Men are embracing the ecology movement, um, and men are better husbands and fathers uh, today than they were 100 years ago, and I believe that this trend will continue. So I believe that art and physics are simply two different languages. They're, they're using um, different uh, means of expression. Art uses image and metaphor. Physics uses numbers and equations. But the visionaries in both fields are basically talking about the same thing. So um, I hope that this presentation has uh, allows you to think of these things in a different way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.